actually on time this time. <laughs> Despite um, all of the efforts, we are still here and we are excited and ready to go. Um, I'd like to introduce you uh, to our education and mentorship live stream. And I'm going to um, have Adrian kind of introduce that in just a moment. Over 60 years, the United Way of Columbia and Montour counties has been an integral part of our community. Our day of giving is a day to gather, kick off our campaign, and share some community wins. The campaign is the driving force of the United Way of Columbia and Montour counties. It provides so many people with the opportunity to give back, to help fund programs, and provide resources to our incredible, hardworking partner agencies. We proudly partner with 26 local nonprofits in the areas of health, education, and financial stability as they devote their time, talents, and passions to caring and supporting the people of our region. The root causes of the different issues faced by our community are interconnected and complex. For example, those facing homelessness or struggling with behavioral or mental health issues may lose their homes, making their children miss school and fall behind, trapping the next generation in a toxic cycle of poverty. Together, we identified four main areas of impact that encompass the various issues we face as a community. Basic and emergency needs, education and mentorship, health and wellness, and United in Recovery. At United Way of Columbia and Montour counties, we make sure that every dollar is accounted for and used responsibly. Beside the dues we pay to be a United Way, your dollars stay in this community unless you specifically ask us to send them elsewhere. We know you want to see the impact of your donation, and this evening you are going to hear from some of our program coordinators and partner agencies about their work in the areas of education and mentorship. We collaborate with local organizations to enable each individual in our community to reach their greatest potential. We do this by supporting programs that educate and mentor area residents. This area of impact includes resources and programs designed to help people with child and youth engagement, early education, literacy, mentorship, and workforce development. Join us as we share with you more about the United Way of Columbia and Montour counties our campaign, our goal for 2021 and 2022, and how you can get involved. It is going to take all of us to ensure that the people of our community will receive the care, assistance, and support they deserve. Hi, everyone. Well, all that troubleshooting paid off. We're here and we're on time. Thank goodness. Um, I am so excited uh, to introduce you guys to um, Ginny of the Bloomsburg Children's Museum. She is their director. Um, I'm going to be bringing her on in just a moment. Um, and I did want to just mention again, um, you guys have blown us away. We've had some pretty major technical issues <laughs> today that um, we persevered through. Dang Nabbit, we were having this day of giving. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm still blown away by the fact that we not only met our goal of $6,000, but we blew past it in the first 90 minutes of this event. And we just surpassed our stretch goal of $8,000. Um, so we thought, heck, let's keep it going. We still have until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning to um, really see this thing through. We still have over 12 hours left. So we're pointing out another stretch goal. We're going to see if we can hit that 9,000. So um, we're absolutely excited and thrilled um, to be partnering with all of you. And we look forward to um, joining um, Ginny at the, um, oh, I think my internet just may have gone down a bit, but we're going to keep persevering because <laughs> that is the name of the game today. Um, and I'm going to bring Jenny on in just a moment.
Hi, Jenny. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited. Oh, I love your shirt. Is that purple? <laughs> Whoa, look at you rocking your swag. Yay. Um, well, we are thrilled to be with you at the Children's Museum. Um, would you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what your mission is with the museum? Sure. Um, I, my name is Jenny Weibel. I'm the director of the Bloomsburg Children's Museum, and we are located right here on 7th Street in the heart of Bloomsburg. Uh, we serve uh, children uh, from infant all the way up through high school, their parents and care caregivers and teachers uh, with programming in the arts, cultures, history, and sciences. We uh, serve about 22,000 people every year and we provide over 500 hours of programming. And 50% of everything we do is at no cost. Wonderful. Wonderful. Why don't you take us around to some of your um, favorite exhibits there at the museum? Sure. Well, of course, we're going to walk over here to our probably our most famous resident, Molly the Turtle. And we'll have a look at Molly. Now she's in her water bath and I'm going to try to snag her because you can't see her really well. So this is Molly. She is a red eared slider. And everything here at the museum is not only fun to see and touch, but we also have important learning points too. So Molly is a red eared slider. She's our most famous turtle. Um, but she's also an invasive species. She's not supposed to be here in Pennsylvania. And what invasive means is just that. She shouldn't be here. So these are the kinds of turtles that people will adopt from a pet store, and then she gets to be too big. They don't know what to do with her. So a lot of times people will just let them go out in the wild, thinking that they'll go on and have a nice life. Um, but what happens is that she starts to compete with food sources and habitats with our native turtles and then she kind of like muscles them out so even though molly's really cool she doesn't belong outdoors you can have her for a pet but turtles live like 25 30 years so when you get a turtle as a pet you're making a huge commitment so that's something really to think about so along with molly she's coming out to say hello to everybody She's sitting under her heat lamp. Hi, Molly. And you're adoring him. <laughs> she just winked at us, too. <laughs> so along with Molly, we have Stinky. Molly and Stinky. Where's Stinky? Stinky's not going to make an appearance. So Stinky is called Stinky because he's a stink pot turtle. And he's actually a native Pennsylvania turtle. And he's being camera shy right now. So we'll go over to these girls. <laughs> these are our newest turtles. We have four of them. They're um, Eastern box turtles. And these are native Pennsylvania turtles. Um, they are a species of concern. So they used to be very, very abundant in Pennsylvania but because of loss of habitat and food source and basking areas from partially from turtles like molly because she does compete with them they uh their numbers start to dwindle um people also will take them out of the wild and try to keep them as pets and then they'll reintroduce them to the wild um, but sometimes they'll carry diseases with them back to the wild when, when people will take them so the fish and boat commission whenever they find somebody that has these turtles that shouldn't have them, um, they seize them from the people and then rehome them to educational institutions like ours. Now, our four turtles, this one's Shelby, who works, who is our assistant director too, and, but we had to name a turtle after Shelby because that's an awesome turtle name. Shelby's actually running our camera. Thank you, um, Shelby. <laughs> Both the turtle and Shelby. <laughs> and this um, this is a good example of why you shouldn't um, take a turtle out of the wild 
and try to care for them if you don't know what you're doing. Um, this is hash brown, and you can see hash brown shells a little bit misshapen. That's because when hash brown um, was taken out of the wild, the people that had hash brown didn't quite know how to take care of her correctly, and her shell um, didn't form properly while, as she was growing. So it's very important if you see a, a wild turtle um, to leave it go. Sometimes people want to rescue turtles off the road, and that's awesome. Um, the tip there is you push the turtle off the road in whatever direction it was heading. Don't try to push it to the closest side because it's still going to want to go where it was trying to get to. So if you see a turtle trying to cross a road, push it in the direction that um, it was traveling. Let's see if Sneaky decided to come out. <laughs> I just learned yeah. something new. Thank you. This is, well, this, is why, thank you. this is why this is the educational segment. I just learned something new. Oh, <laughs> you're so, so that's, that's stinky. He's full grown um, and he's a, a common musk turtle or a stink pot turtle. That's why we call him stinky. Um, <laughs> and he is an aquatic turtle, whereas the, um, the box turtles that we just looked at, they're terrestrial. And then Molly's kind of a combination of both. She likes to have water, but also some basking area. And this so is Stinky. That Stinky's a, a baby turtle, but he's not. He's full grown. Oh, he's, he's absolutely adorable. adorable. So even though we have these awesome turtles, they're great to look at, they're, they're fun to, to watch, but it's also a very important learning points too. So we, this is our Greenway area, and this part of the museum is dedicated to Pennsylvania flora and fauna. So we talk about everything that lives and grows here in Pennsylvania. One of the new uh, parts of the exhibit, because we're always doing something different here at the museum, we have a new native bird exhibit going in. Um, we have a, a couple of volunteers that have been working really hard on this, but it's going to uh, give you the, the sights and sounds of all of the native birds that we have here in Pennsylvania. And then we're kind of excited about that coming in. We also have plans to redo our lobby and we're also upgrading some of the other exhibits in our Greenway area. We have some plans drawn up that we're gonna get rid of our stairs here and make it more accessible with a ramp system. Um, so we're very excited about that too. Now that we're able to start construction again and building prices are starting to come back down, we're trying to get those plans rolling. So we'll walk over this way. And we, we have two exhibits de dedicated to indigenous people here in Pennsylvania. We have our Eastern Woodlands Longhouse, um, which is a favorite of people to come. Um, kids love to play in here, but there's also a lot of um, learning uh, points, teaching points in here, so let's go in. The artwork in here is spectacular. Oh, wow. Um, actually traveled up to New York um, to a historical site to study um, an actual longhouse um, and speak with indigenous people about how we should be presenting uh, their life and their heritage. And we kind of replicated exactly how they told us um, to present it. So um, it's really a, a cool place. Kids love to hang out in here. There's a lot to learn in here. We have a lot of leveled learning. So all the stuff down low is real hands-on and manipulatives for kids. But as you get taller um, and older, <laughs> there's a lot of, of learning points in here that you can learn about the indigenous tribes that were originally here in Pennsylvania. I think it's great that you guys took the extra effort to really um, approach the um, local tribes and make sure that they felt like they were being represented well. Um, that's an, an, that's a, I think, <laughs> a, something that um, is commendable, but also just lends itself to the accuracy of your exhibit. So I'm like really pleased to hear that. And I did not know that. I'm learning so much. This is so great. <laughs> Anything, anything that we present here at the museum, we thoroughly vet. Uh, we are um, meant for children to play in here, but we are our sticklers for accuracy. Um, and then anything that's culturally sensitive, like our indigenous peoples uh, exhibit or 
Egypt or even Passage to PA, which is about immigration to Pennsylvania. Uh, we talk to local historical societies, but we want everything to be accurate and present it in the way that it was meant to be presented. Thank you for doing that. Um, what else do you have to show show us? Sure. Well, we're going to take a walk down to our low, lower level. Upper level has a lot to do with Pennsylvania flora and fauna, but our lower level is a little bit more eclectic. Um, we have our Pennsylvania coal mine, which is probably one of our most um, sought after exhibits. We've had people actually from all over the world come here to look at our coal mine. We just had a graduate student from, was she from Korea, I believe? Um, she was doing a, a, a dissertation on um, Pennsylvania coal mines, and she found out that we have this exhibit here and she spent the better part of a day going through the exhibit and learning about all the artifacts that we have on display here, and then also playing with all the things that we have for kids. But um, that was kind of cool that we were actually included in her dissertation. Um, we have, of course, walking through Egypt. Um, oh, let's go look at our newest exhibit, which is soup. We, last time we did this, we were working on it, but now it's open. Our new health exhibit. Yes, we got the sneak peek last year, and now it's yeah. fully operational, correct? Whoa, look at that brain. Uh, it, it's called the Superpower of You, and we'll go inside of it now. So it is open. Oh, I can turn on the light box. Um, you'll see that Mighty Mouth is back in action. <gasps> Woo. And we actually have some dental x-rays that the kids can check out on the lay box. <laughs> of course, we have the, the guys that you can brush their teeth. Um, we have some information about nutrition, a game about nutrition. Um, everything is superhero themed. This is a, a game about um, the new uh, nutrition labels and how to read them correctly. And when it says whole grain, it doesn't really mean whole grain and how to kind of decipher that. Um, this is, has become a quick favorite. Uh, it's a giant skeleton that you can kind of take apart and put together to, to create the, the skeleton. Ooh, that's appropriate for Halloween coming up. <laughs> there, that's a great idea. Maybe we should put a little witch's hat on it. <laughs> um, this is also a favorite because it talks about the guts and your digestive tract. and um, you can push the button and it shows you where the various parts of your um, digestive tract is in your body and about what, what they do. Um, we have a toilet game, which we didn't boot up. I turned the power on, but I forgot to put it on. But you push a button and it'll tell you if you've made a good food choice or a bad uh, food choice. And it's represented by either a sad poop emoji or a rainbow sparkly poop emoji, if you chose right. <laughs> Along with sound effects and the visuals and everything. That's <laughs> awesome. So talk about potty humor, that's it. <laughs> well, when um, you're talking about have, the body, uh, it's appropriate. We have a, a, a game that makes you a little bit more conscious about how much sugar you are taking in when you drink that iced mocha frozen latte. <laughs> and everybody does not want to think about it, but you're drinking this much sugar. Oh, wow. 26. In one drink. Whoa. So there's all sorts of drinks here and the kids have to match um, what, which drink goes to um, how much weight. And then we have a little bit about diabetes and cardiovascular health. So um, I explained it last time, but what we did was we re-imaged our health exhibit to reflect the um, health risk factors um, in Columbia Montour County. So even oh. though we serve anybody who comes to our door, our um, designated service area is Columbia Montour County. So we um, focus a lot on the needs in our direct community. Um, 
So we looked at health risk assessments that Geisinger Road did, that the Pennsylvania Bar for Health did, and we said, what does our community, um, what are they having trouble with? And we tried to um, address it in this, in this exhibit. So one of the things is your brain and how your brain functions and um, what happens if you put something in your body that you shouldn't put in your body, what happens when you don't get enough sleep, um, what happens if you get bullied, and um, the brain room is becoming a big favorite because it's kind of cool and dark, um, but it has all sorts of uh, visuals that show you um, how your brain works and what happens when different stressors are put on your brain. Oh, wow. So we were really excited to open it up. We have one more um, interactive game that's an exercise game that's still in development, um, but it'll be out here on this wall. Um, but that's coming, but we have most of it done. Well, that's awesome. I do remember um, the last time we visited you during our last day, day of giving that um, you guys were prototyping the heart valve um, exhibit. And I just thought that was so neat how you guys actually had to go through a whole testing process to develop the, um, the exhibits. And um, it's really hands-on and it's very... Um, it uses engineering brain, but also creative brain. So it's it's really impressive what you guys go through to, to create these exhibits. And like you said, you build everything from scratch, right? Like this is all like built in-house. Right. And um, everything here is built by um, volunteers um, and museum staff. We do not farm things out. We do get help from um, local uh, industries like Sekasui actually helped us make the brain stem. Um, they, uh, the, the inner tube there that holds the fiber op optics, Sekasui actually formed that for us. And then systematic filing systems in Danville, they actually donated the materials for it. So we do have partners that help us um, create what we've planned out, but we don't, we don't farm things out, we do it ourselves. Wow. And this is the heart game that you were talking about. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yeah. I remember. So this actually, um, with the prototyping, what's happened is we've actually um, had it out on the floor, and it's gone through three <laughs> um, revamps because we put it out on the floor and see how the kids break it. <laughs> and then think, okay, this is how this has to be engineered a little bit better. So this version of it seems to be working pretty good. So fingers crossed we have it. Wow. And then over this side, we have a maker space. Woo. Um, right now we have our 3D printers going. We have several 3D printers. Um, oh, wow. This is what that one's actually printing out. It's printing out a little uh, dragon. Oh, oh my gosh, it's adorable. <laughs> and we have um, a couple of 3D printers. Um, I think we have four. And we run classes about them. We have had kids come in here and print things out on their own. They come up with an idea. This is actually something a student designed, uh, made the computer file for and printed out himself. Oh my gosh. Wow. So this was, the, he, he took the good one, but this, the first print didn't print out so good, so we kind of kept it. But a student actually designed that. Aww. This is another neat one. Um, this is actually Mighty Bow. Oh. And we had a, um, a group of, of kids, teenagers, high school students, that took 3D images of Mighty Bow, our exhibit, and then they actually made a 3D file to print out on the 3D printer. So, oh wow, the um, so the maker space. Do you do classes through that as well? We do. We have classes on 3D printing. Um, we have a laser cutter over here that we do laser cutting classes. Um, this was a young boy that 
Um, during COVID, he sent us a picture of one of the projects that we had sent out over the community, and we actually engraved his picture in and, and cut it out on a little um, piece of cardboard, and then we sent it to him. We thought that was kind of cool because the next, the next, we were doing live cats during uh, the shutdown, and we'd uh, distribute STEM kits, and I think this one was making an Egyptian pyramid. And he just sent us the cutest little picture, so then the next class, the simulcast that we did was about the laser cutter and how the laser cutter works. So we actually used his picture as an example. That's incredible. I really do feel that the um, uh, STEM kits that you guys put together during the pandemic, it was such a proactive and um, engaging thing to do for all of our families and for the students um, who were, everyone was so cooped up and what a fun project to do. Um, while everyone was home that, you know, could be educational. So we were so impressed to watch you guys um, meet the needs of the community during the pandemic. And so thank you for that. That was amazing. Thank you. We, um, um, self, almost selfish reasons, but we really enjoyed the feedback that we got about that program. We had lots of parents um, expressing to us how difficult it was for their kids, uh, particularly in the red phase when we were completely shut down. They couldn't go out and see their friends. They were just like on um, their video games and watching TV the whole time. And then when they had access to these little kits that we were distributing, um, it gave them something to look forward to. We put them out every week um, and they uh, not only learned from it, it kind of gave them a sense of normalcy yeah. that, um, they know the museum, they know the staff here, they know the instructors here, and it was still that, that connection um, that sometimes you can't get just over video. Um, we really appreciated the, the ability to reach out um, to people over video, but some of the communities that we serve don't have internet service, and um, we still were able to reach those communities um, and, and serve them. So we were really happy with that program. And in fact, it's still going on. We're still distributing the STEM kits through uh, local libraries. Um, and we're going now all the way up to Williamsport and all the way down to Sunbury. Wow. Uh, but we're working with um, the McBride Library in Berwick. Um, we're working with, um, in Danville. Uh, Thomas, can you hear me? Thomas, Library in Danville. Um, and we're actually doing in-person classes at the Bloomberg Library. So um, that that program, is, it, it had legs and we're still doing it and reaching communities that we were, normally wouldn't be able to reach. I think that's one of the things, you know, like it's always trying to find the silver lining through our difficulties. And I think the fact that you, you guys are still continuing and the program and then also that it's expanded your reach is so powerful. Um, and one of the good things that I, I feel like came out of the pandemic, um, Thomas Beaver Library in Danville, I think is what you were referring or yes. trying to remember. Um, yeah, they're lovely. Um, so what are we looking at here? We're just, we're watching the printer go. Yeah, so um, this is the 3D printers. And then um, normally what we have out, we just have different activities that we set out that the kids could, can um, readily use. Typically, we have the glass down in front of the 3D printers. We'll have it running so people can see it. And then here's a here's a pro tip. If you go and ask us at the front desk what we're printing out and what that is, we will give you something that we um, printed out already. So oh. um, whenever we have a curious little mind ask us about it, we give them a prize because we like curious Aww. minds. Encouraging curiosity. I love it. I love it. Um, I actually had the opportunity to do, um, I think it was during your, was it your open house with the chamber, yes. um, that you guys had like a little soldering station at the maker space where I was able to make a pin that I still have that <laughs> I, lights up with little eyes. It's a little robot and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm obsessed with it. So, um, I thought, I just love that you guys are always, um, 
looking for that that moment of interaction and looking for that moment that teachable moment to spark curiosity it's one of the things that i love about the museum and how hands on it is and like you said i never heard that word leveled playing where like the things on the on the on the bottom are more interactive and the things at the top as you get taller are like more informative like that i didn't know that that was a, that was something again learning something new so <laughs> Is there anything else you wanted to show us today, Ginny? Um, we're always happy to show you things. Um, speaking of like like the soldering and learning, we're always doing like little classes like that. So it's not just the stagnant museum that with our exhibits, even though they're really awesome. I mean, we always have our hands-on crafts that constantly change. Today we had our homeschool hangout program where um, we run special programs just for homeschooling families and um, we present a subject and today it was spooky engineering and uh, we made um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide bubbles out of dry ice Ooh. we made um, simple circuits and made light up ghosts we did some candy corn um, structure engineering and what else did we do i can't even remember it was so fun airplanes oh we made um spooky airplanes and you had to carry a cargo and figure out where the cargo needed to be distributed on the airplanes. We had a blast. Um, we, we have activities out anywhere from preschool all the way up to 12th grade. And it's a kind of a come and go program, but um, that's one of our favorite programs here because it's, it's just fun to see all the kids of all different ages engage and learning around an activity. Um, and next week we actually have uh, Summer Brandon from uh, Ricketts Glen State Park. She's going to come down here and talk about turtles. What are oh. our subjects? <laughs> uh, I'm super obsessed with Stinky now. I think Stinky may be more. I love Molly too, but Stinky had me at the little paddling in the feet. Oh my gosh, she's <laughs> yeah. so cute. Um, so um, I had a few questions. I didn't know if anybody um, in the chat wanted to ask. Um, Ginny or her staff, any questions, but I will definitely um, get, get the ball rolling. Ginny, how, how long do you say it takes from concept to completion to build an exhibit? About how long is that process? Um, it'll take years, actually, um, from the initial concept um, to then uh, create the plans for it. Um, and then also uh, develop the content. So typically, um, I'll give you an example, our simple machines. We had the concept that we wanted to make a Rube Goldberg-esque um, exhibit that went through all six simple machines. So yeah. that was the idea. And then we had to um, talk to engineers about how to um, create the, the actual contraption. Um, fortunately, we have a wonderful bunch of retired engineers that are volunteers for us and also um, an industrial technology teacher who made the CAD drawings for us. Um, and then we also talked to some larger museums and got advice. Um, a lot of them told us that they, we wouldn't be able to do it, that we wouldn't be able to create a, a exhibit where the kids actually interacted with it. Um, it could be self-contained and it would work. But once you add those kids, you know, turning levers and spinning wheels, um, they said that they would break it too much. But that wasn't acceptable to us. We had to make something that the kids could operate. So um, they really thought about it. And actually just the planning of it took close to, I think, six months. Wow. And then we started to construct it. And that particular piece we built in three separate sections. Um, once one section was built, we would put it up for a period and saw how the kids used it and saw if there was any issues with it. Um, take it back down, make repairs, put it back up, and then put the next section up. So that one in and of itself was probably a little over two years from concept all the way up to where it's functioning. Wow. Um, the commitment and, and like you said, vetting through everything is really um, impressive. So um, how do you fund projects? 
like the simple machines or like the maker space or the coal miner um, exhibit. Was it, how do we find? Mm-hmm. Sorry, the, the laser cutter, let's walk away from the laser cutter, it's hard to hear. Um, <laughs> so we fund projects through um, donors. Um, so for, for an example, the health exhibit that we just opened up, we had the idea that we wanted to uh, change up our health exhibit and really focus on the risk factors in Columbia Montour counties. So we reached out to the Pennsylvania Department of Health we reached out to Basinger. Um, we reached out to the Columbia County Farm Bureau, um, people who would have a vested interest in helping us, the Arcata Foundation too. So we have to apply for uh, multiple grants. Um, we look for community partners. Like I said, Sekisui um, helped us form um, part of our one exhibit. Um, we also rely heavily on um, private donations um, because uh, any revenue that we generate here at the museum goes right back into programming. We run our programs um, at a loss. Um, some programs we do charge for, a lot of programs we don't charge anything for. And we need to generate um, some admission sales, some gift shop sales um, to be able to run the programs we do. But when we have a major undertaking like an exhibit, um, then we have to look outside for funding sources. And also the United Way is a huge supporter of the Children's Museum. We just could not do um, what we do without the support that we have from the United Way. Well, thanks. We, we appreciate you guys. We're, we believe in what you're doing. So um, I'm really curious, Ginny, what motivates you to do this? Because it's it definitely sounds like a labor of love and a commitment to children and to teaching through hands-on interaction. So I'm just curious, what what inspires you? What what motivates you to, to do this work? So um, anybody who works for any nonprofit is a labor of love. <laughs> um, and definitely the museum is a labor of love. Um, my backstory is I have a, a degree in chemistry. I used to work. Um, at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, running a research lab. Had kids, we moved up here looking for a little bit of a quieter life. And, and I had, I was running a grant writing business from my home. And I took my kids here as visitors when they were littler and fell in love with the place. And I grew up out right outside of Philadelphia. So I had the Franklin Institute, the Please and Touch Museum, the Philadelphia Art Museum. And when I walked into this place, I was in awe. I, I thought, Wow, the, those other places, are, I mean, they don't hold a candle to this place. Just Aww. the feeling of it, the grassroots of it, um, I just fell in love with it. And I started doing some programs um, with them, a science club. And um, I just loved seeing kids, the amazement on their faces when they're able to do something, when they discover something. Um, it's, it's just such joy and personal satisfaction to see the families come through here, um, enjoy the place, learn something, they bond. It's so great to see families sitting together, doing an activity, um, talking about the exhibits, um, the events that we do, just the community involvement um, that we get, it's, it's really wonderful. So, I mean, we don't do it for the money, it's a labor of love, um, and definitely it's, it's worth it. This, the, the, all the the nonprofits that we've seen in this area since we've moved here, I mean, it's just impress, impressive the amount of, of, of effort that goes into this community. Well, we, I think a theme that's evolved over the course of today um, is that when people are all doing what they love and what they're passionate about, we really can answer the needs, the needs of a community and um, as a village come together and holistically and organically, um, you know, that's a big part of what United Way does is bring people together to strategize, to partner, to advocate for, um, to, to, you know, empower the people who are already doing it to do what they do even better and to reach an even greater audience. Um, so I just want to thank you for the impact that you're having on our community. 
And I did want to mention too, that anyone who donates during this segment, we're going to give them a $50 gift certificate to the, uh, the children's museum. Um, they can use it towards a membership. They can use it towards any of the classes or um, workshops that you guys um, do. So we're really thrilled to be able to offer that as a, as a thank you um, for anyone who gives during this time. So um, uh, what, what, um, would you say, Ginny, in kind of closing, what does your organization do or, or what does it mean to your organization to live united? Oh, we live united every day here. Um, uh, we um, partner in our community, just uh, the volunteers that we get. We have an amazing pool of volunteers. I mean, look around you. Our staff is so small. Uh, we only have two full-time people. We serve 22,000 people every year. Um, the volunteers that we get from this community is amazing. Um, that makes us all live united. The partnerships that we have with the YMCA, um, the Bloomsburg Public Library, BT, the Exchange, um, all of this, our sister um United Way of agencies, when we band together and do amazing things together, Booberg is coming up. It's like all the nonprofits here in Bloomsburg. Um, mm -hmm. We all get together and as a community and put on this wonderful community event. Um, it's just the power of community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's totally living United every day. Oh, well, thank you, Jenny. Um, is there anything else that you want to share before we um, sign off? Um, anything on your heart left to, I mean, we've, we've chatted quite a bit, so it's okay. I could talk about the museum forever and ever. <laughs> we but, might take you up on it. We have some really great things coming up. We have our, our gingerbread contest yeah. um, out. It's free to enter. You can win prizes. It's such a wonderful thing. I love coming in the museum and opening the doors and smelling all this gingerbread. Mm -hmm. um, we also are doing our uh, sixth through 12th grade science fair this year. Um, oh. We uh, were having it at the Bloomsburg Fire Hall. They were generously donated their, their social hall because it got too big for the museum. Oh, and wow. um, that's free to enter too. Um, and we send those kids on that win our fair to uh, the regional competition at Susquehanna University. Uh, we have arts and, and science programs going on all the time. So please check our website out and come and visit us. We'd love to see you. Oh, well, thank you, Ginny. This has been so much fun. I loved seeing all the all of your favorite exhibits. And I loved um, hearing about all the work that you do. Um, we I'm always blown away by the workshops that come up, especially on Instagram. When I see them, I'm like, oh, I want to go. And I, you know, we're always sharing them. But you guys have such a so many things to offer. So there really is something there for everyone. And what I love is like as like as parents that we we get to go. This is like one of those places where you actually can really enjoy going because you're learning. Um, you're learning as well. And so uh, I just, and I learned so much even in this, this live stream with you um, and, you know, about the turtles and um, about how to like push them off the road. And the, I never knew that. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for all the curiosity that you spark in young minds um, every day. And we just really appreciate what you do. And thank you for taking time with us today to join us during our day of giving. Um, we're so proud of you and we can't wait till next year. And we'll be, I'm sure we'll be visiting you soon. Um, I love um, one of my favorite events that you do is the May the Force be with you. So that's, that's, that's a fun one. So <laughs> But thank you again, Ginny. Thank you, um, Shelby, behind the camera. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks for having us. <laughs> yes. Oh, and thanks for the little tip about asking about the laser printer. Everybody, mm -hmm. um, be sure to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ginny. Have a good one. Bye-bye. So folks, that um, about wraps up our education and mentorship segment. I did want to take this opportunity to mention um, we do have, we did, we're actually a little bit closer towards our goal. Um, 
we got another $100 donation. So we're at $8,275 towards our, our next stretch goal. Um, so if you have the opportunity and the means, we certainly don't encourage giving beyond what you're capable of. Um, but we did uh, want to share that these impact areas, um, the gift of education for $100, you can assure that a child can attend two pre-K classes a week for a whole month. Um, we know that child care and early childhood education, um, well, early childhood education is vital, but child care can also be expensive. So this helps us subsidize some of our child care programs and allows for kids to um, get that jump start in life um, to help build them towards a stronger, healthier future. Um, so if you do have uh, a moment and you feel willing, please consider making a donation. Um, we are open. Our, our um, day of giving doesn't end until 8 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, that will be our next live stream as at 8 a.m. And we're, we actually started on time. So I'm hopeful that our technical issues have been worked out. And we once again, thank you all for uh, being patient with us as we worked through that. Um, but again, thank you all. And we will see you at 8 a.m. to celebrate. I, I'm already blown away. Um, you guys really showed up and turned out in, in a way that is so impressive and really shows your commitment to building healthy uh, safe and sustainable com uh, community right here at home. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for making this such a special day of giving. And we look forward to telling you more about what we um, accomplished uh, tomorrow morning during our 8 a.m. live stream. Thank you all and enjoy your night.